we went from in a year and a half, this company was at 4 million when I started and we ended up at 12 million in a year and a half. So 3X growth in a year and a half from losing 500K the first year to 1.5 or 1.7 million profitable at the end of the time. Welcome back to the Beyond the Wealth podcast. This is our second official episode from the name change and we have an amazing guest here today, Wade Houston. I promise you guys, you have heard some great stories, but this is gonna be one of the best entrepreneurial success stories I think you're gonna hear out of any of the previous episodes we've done. Thank you so much for coming on the show, brother. Thanks for having me, Andres. I know about your story and we're gonna dive really deep into it, but give people just a little bit of a background on who you are. Yeah, for sure. So uh, I grew up in Vermont. I grew up in a very rural area, loving family, uh, sports were life, uh, playing hockey, football. I was obsessed with sports 24 seven until drugs came into the picture. I've always had an extremely addictive personality. When I started playing hockey, I started playing 24 seven. I got really good. Anything that I would do, I would just, I would do it addictively. And so when drugs and alcohol came into the picture, when I was 13, I started smoking a lot of weed, started doing mushrooms, started drinking a lot. And I was able to function at a very high level with drugs and alcohol for a period of time. And then I started having some, some serious judicial consequences. So, um, before I was 24, I had, uh, three DUIs, uh, multiple assault charges. I got, I got recruited to play hockey in prep school, got kicked out. Uh, I got recruited to play football in college after getting, well, I got kicked off my junior hockey team. Then I went and played college football, got kicked out of college, came back home, uh, basically was going to community college and had all these issues. You know, I was drinking, doing drugs, um, you know, I had those DUIs, so I lost my license. I had assault charges. So for a period, of, for a long period of time, I had a, a parole officer, a corrections officer. I was just in the system, you know, I was, I spent a hundred thousand dollars on a lawyer uh, before the age of 22. I basically, I had a lawyer on retainer from 17 to 22. Wow. Um, and after getting kicked out of prep school and coming back home, uh, so I went to prep school in New Hampshire, came back home to Vermont. And since I couldn't play sports during a, a small window of time, I decided to start selling Coke because I wanted some extra money. I always had that hustle that grind in me. Uh, so I started selling Coke, never did it during that time, uh, but sold it things went well. My lawyer, you know, got wind from some people in town that I was selling Coke. And I remember he called me and he was like, Hey man, you gotta stop selling Coke. And, uh, I was like, dude, I'm already out. You know, this is how delusional I was. Like, I was like, dude, I'm already out. Don't even worry about it. And I just, you know, hung up the phone and my life sort of continued on this path of, I would have these successes, uh, most of them based on my God given skills and ability, right? Like, yeah, I, I practice hockey and you know, I got good grades in school, but for the most part, most of my success was predicated on God-given skill and ability. And I would just constantly sabotage, you know, unknowingly just get in trouble and bring everything down time after time. And so, um, I think I was 23. Uh, yeah. After my third DUI, I stopped drinking. Um, I started going to AA meetings because I had to get my court paper signed. Uh, but I was still doing drugs. I was still smoking weed and doing mushrooms and doing everything else. And, um, eventually I got addicted to Oxycontin. So, you know, I've, I've had this laundry list of bullshit past. And like I said, I grew up in a loving family, a loving home, amazing morals. You know, my mom gave me unconditional love forever. My dad has taught me an incredible amount about life and persuasion and business and, and everything. And, uh, yeah, I got addicted to Oxycontin. You know what this is? Yeah, I've heard some, I've heard stories. So Purdue Pharma created Oxycontin back in the day and they marketed it as the same addictive uh, quality as Percocet and Vicodin, when really it was about a hundred times more addictive than both of those substances. Uh, it was synthetic heroin and this was an epidemic in the United States and we were right on the forefront of it. When this became a thing, we all got super addicted. And, uh, so I end up doing about five Oxycontin 80s a day. And where did that come from? Like, where did that addiction start from? Because uh, I feel like you were doing like mushrooms, weed, not too crazy. Now we're headed up to like some serious narcotic. Yeah. So, uh, right. It was always like somewhat harmless stuff. Now 
I'm no longer playing sports and I'm, I'm back at college sort of just clawing my way back. You know, like I'm getting really good grades and I'm studying finance and I kind of think I'm back. And my family's like, all right, you're back in school and you're doing pretty well. We used to play these poker games and the poker games were cheap. They were a $10 buy-in with all my broke, you know, college friends. Yeah. And one day, uh, one of the kids who was our friend was a drug dealer. Um, he's like, I don't have 10 bucks on me. And we're like, all right, well, then you can't play, motherfucker. Like, we're not spotting you. And so he goes, but I have this. And it was an Oxycontin 80. So he took the $70 from everyone else out and he put the, be we called them beans. He put the bean in the middle. And he's like, you guys cool playing for this. I looked at my buddy, I'm like, what is that thing? And he's like, it's like a Percocet or a Viking. And I said, okay, yeah, fine. Fuck it. Let's all, we'll, we'll play for this. So I win that game. And then after I, I win the Oxycontin, they're like, dude, be careful with this thing. This shit is like, you can't do that whole thing and you don't swallow it. You got to like take the green film off and crush it down and you're going to do like a quarter of it. So dude, I did it. And honestly, the very first moment I did it, I felt like Bradley Cooper in Limitless, Edward Moore. Huh. Like, okay, it's like synthetic heroin. So for most people, that it's a downer. They get mm -hmm. a little bit slow and a little bit tired. My body responds to narcotics a little bit differently than most. If I were to do cocaine, I would go to bed. I would stand in the corner by myself. I wouldn't talk to anybody and I would be tired and I would go to start yawning and I would go to bed. If I smoke weed or do something like Oxycontin, I start to get energized. And when I would do Oxycontin, I would get incredibly focused, driven, and I would just operate on a different level. And so once I did this, I was able to really operate at a very high level. I'm taking finance classes. At the time I was managing a bank. This is kind of like how fucked up my life is, is I'm doing this. I have this laundry list of a bullshit record. I, by a chance, get a job as a, a commercial loan officer at a bank. And after six months, the person ahead of me quits their job. And they're like, you're the only person fit to be the manager. I'm like 21 years old, 23 years old, a fucking degenerate. And, but they let me do it. And so I'm like doing Oxycontin, doing this. We're managing drug dealers. My, my buddy's dad at the time had given him a bunch of apartments and said to us, hey, why don't you guys manage these apartments? Fix them up and rent them out. So we fixed them up as nice as we could. And instead of renting them out, signing a contract, we rented them out to all the drug dealers in town, cash up front for the year. Oh, man. So, right, so we have a shitload yeah. of money. We're getting Oxycontin from, um, you know, initially this kid put the Oxycontin in the middle, but very soon he wasn't able to provide enough Oxycontin for all of us because it's so addicting. You go from one you know, a quarter of an $80 pill per day to at the end, I was doing five. It's insane. You know, so I mean, I'm doing like a couple hundred dollars worth of Oxycontin a day. That's, that is nuts. So we had to con this girl in Texas to send us one of someone in her family's prescription every week. And they had like, she had multiple family members and people that were, were on Oxycontin and not taking them. And we would get her to get those big Skittles bags, the, the Halloween yeah. Skittles bags. And we would make her weigh the Skittles bag. And then we would weigh the 500 Oxycontin 80s. And then we would never take the little orange tag off, make a slit, squeeze out the appropriate amount of Skittles, squeeze in the 500 80s, and then re-weigh that shit until it was perfect. And then we would have her put the orange thing back, the orange price tag back on it, super glue it. And then I would make her, because I was watching so many gangster movies like Blow and Belly, I would make her write a birthday card each week an actual handwritten birthday card as if this was like a real package with, you know, tissue paper and some other bullshit. And so every week she was sending us $40,000 worth of drugs in the mail. So dude, at the time, this was such a big deal and such an epidemic. And they started noticing a flood of Oxycontin in town. Not, not, not that we were the only dealers. There was a lot of other people doing this as well, Yeah, but we were certainly contributing to, to some of this. So they brought in a task force from Boston. Uh, undercover agents to to sort of keep an eye on the on the scene. So you know I'm sitting there, an ex. You know I got recruited in scholarships to play hockey and football, perfect grades, great family, and I sit down for this poker game and I get hooked on oxycontin. And now I'm in a whole new world. I mean, yes, I had dealt coke when I was younger, so I've always you know I was always like kind of in a fucked up mindset yeah. of like I'll do whatever. It wasn't always rosy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Pretty much since 13, you know I like. Developed a mindset of kind of I'm in, I'm untouchable. Uh, Where do you so, think that came from, if you don't mind me asking? Um, it was a lot of the reflexive um, feedback that I got from other people. Uh, this is something I never really talk about because it sounds so conceited. 
But I think the way that I look, the way that I present myself, and the way that I speak in social situations, people just wanted to give me pardon for everything. Um, also, my dad taught me persuasion and how to handle a social situation from a very early age. You know, at seven years old, he said, hey, you're the man at the table now. You're going to order the food when the server comes. And I said, okay, I can do that. And he says, but when the server comes, you're going to ask them your name, their name, and then you're going to repeat their name in a sentence. And I remember thinking like, dad, I don't want to do that. Like, this is stupid. So the server would come to the, to the table and I would say, what's your name? And she would say, Jenny. And I would say, Jenny, it's nice to meet you. And then he would even sometimes make me say a, a, a sentence with Jenny's name in it. Like, Jenny, that's a nice shirt or Jenny something. Like, dad, this is so dumb. He's like, watch. So we did it a couple of times. And I remember like one of the early dinners, we were on a, you know, a summer vacation in Maine. <laughs> and this, uh, my Shirley Temples were empty. Me and my sister, Shirley Temples. And he says, okay, wait, now call the waiter by name. And so I think the guy's name was John or whatever it was. I don't remember. But but he, if I say, uh, excuse me, John, John comes right over and I say, John, may I please have sh two Shirley Temples, one for me and my sister? And he says, absolutely, I'll be right, uh, I'll be right back. I look over and there's probably a 50-year-old man sitting there with his wife. And the entire time he's flailing. Sir, excuse me, sir. Hey, buddy, sir. Never getting the attention of the waiter. But yet... I lightly, not even screaming, not flailing, just say, excuse me, John. And he comes right over. And so now I have command of the social situation just from utilizing someone's name. And I had my Shirley Temple on the table before that guy ever had the attention of the waiter. And it was from that moment that I said, wow, I can control a social situation differently. If I just remember someone's name, maybe ask them a question and get them engaged in the conversation, I can now basically manipulate the social situation how I want. So as a result of learning, you know, to have a social presence at an early age, probably a little bit of the way that I look, I basically just was able to get away with a lot. Um, I think also, you know, you could look at a lot of the, the things that I didn't do well or the things I got in trouble in and say, okay, wow, but you're still the captain of the hockey team, the captain of the football team, the quarterback. Uh, dude, I never got a B in my life. I, I'm straight A's always. I didn't even try. You know, it just like everything sort of came natural to me imagine if i had actually tried when i was a kid yeah. you know it would have been crazy yeah but so i think i just got a lot of pardon and and i felt untouchable because well also i flipped two cars end over end on the highway going over 80 miles an hour with no seatbelt on once the jaws of life pulled me out and the other one i just got like i don't know how the car didn't get crumbles but dude imagine the car crushes i flip end over end and i'm trapped in the car like this with no seatbelt on and they come and pull me out with the jaws of life and they say do you have any have you sustained any injuries and I say yeah I got a cut on my pinky like and I just this weird shit like happened to me where I was like dude I'm just invincible you know what I mean I mean shit like, just by listening to this you've gotten a lot of chances here and you're like 23 24 right now dude I I was once out in downtown uh Burlington in Vermont where I lived and some kid was talking shit to my buddy's girlfriend and so I just went over to him, I picked him up, I hit him in the face twice, and I threw him through a big, a massive glass window in this restaurant where we all used to hang out outside. Shattered the whole thing, police immediately come over, and I thought it was his buddies trying to grab me, so I cock back and elbow somebody straight in the face, and I turned around and it's a police officer. And so do these other four cops, like immediately knee to the back, face, like everything, like drag my face across the pavement. And dude, I'm in the car with the police officer who I elbowed in the face, who's like already got a, like a red mark right yeah. here. And they're like, "We're you're gonna ha you're gonna get aggravated assault on a police officer. Like you just got two DUIs. Like you, dude, you're you're like a bad kid, you know." And dude, I was like, "Officer," and I'm fucked up. Remember, I'm like almost blacked out. And I'll never forget the conversation. I was like, "Look, officer, I completely understand where you're at. If I was you, I would probably be more angry than you are." And in fact, I would probably even think about another charge to be able to tack on because of what I just did to you. And I don't blame you. But let me just help you understand a little bit where I was at and in the heat of the moment, why I did what I did. And then I slowly explained to them. And then I also, you know, worked with him on like trying to be nice the entire car ride and talk to him a little about who I was as a person. And I get to the police station and you know what he says to me? I'm going to charge you with simple assault. I recommend that you get a lawyer and plead this out so that it gets wiped away. 
just through a conversation in the car, just from working on him. And so this kind of shit has happened to me time and time and time again. I mean, dude, I'm talking like I went to Mexico once with Coke, Molly, ketamine, Xanax, and weed. Weed. I, I took out every 20 Marlboro cigarettes. I re-rolled joints in the exact same size, and I put the joints back into the Marlboro case and then vacuum sealed it. If you're going to carry drugs, at least carry pills and powder so the dogs don't smell it or somebody doesn't smell it. I was reckless enough to just carry weed all in my toiletries case. And I was such a sick fuck that instead of taking the 4.2 ounce cologne bottle out so that my shit wouldn't get searched, I would leave it in. Because I just like the fucking danger. 4.2 ounces. I know 4 ounces is the max you can have. Right? So they would, every time my shit would go through security, I would get, I would get in Mexico, would go through security. They would take the cologne bottle out and they would search all my shit. And I would just think, this is fucking exciting. Wow. Bro, there was a time where they took the shit out. The, the, the woman is searching through my toiletries bag. And I have a football in the duffel bag that I was carrying. And one of the um, workers there, who was also on the security line, takes the football out. And he gives it a toss to one of the other guys. And I start tossing the football with these two guys in the airport while she's searching my bag. And she looks up and she says, what are you guys doing? And I speak Spanish. So I said, estamos juzgando. I was like, we're just fucking around. We're just yeah. playing around. And dude, the second that she realized that I spoke Spanish and couldn't even believe it, she started laughing because she wasn't expecting it. She just put all my shit back and said, dame ese fútbol. Like, yeah, boom. And dude, that's just kind of how my life went. And then I'm laughing with these guys. Like, and I just walked through and it was nothing. And so like, you're feeling invincible. Always. Like, like my whole life, I just felt so invincible because of what I was able to navigate in certain situations. I, I never really felt the pressure. I, I always thought like, there is going to be a way out of this situation. And even if the worst happens, like this is going to be fun and exciting. I was just a, a seeker of adrenaline, you know, just a complete adrenaline junkie at all costs. There's definitely somebody listening to this that feels the same, somebody that's younger that can feel like they're relating to that version of you. What would you say to them on how to handle that? Because clearly it got the best of you in in that time frame that you felt like you were invincible. So you're doing things as crazy as asking to get searched, knowing what you had. What would you say to that person listening right now? Well, it's interesting because if I think back about where I was during that period of time, Whenever someone said to me, you should clean up your act or you should get sober or you should stop doing Oxycontin. Whenever someone said that to me, I thought I'm going to do it more. And I'm going to prove to all you guys that I'm capable of doing drugs and being this kind of street thug, but at the same time running some sort of enterprise and, and, and escalating a business and making money. And so everybody's different about what kind of ex uh, help that they accept and at what time. But this is going to sound so fucked up. My advice or my hope for those people in that situation is that they come to a point in their life where they feel empty, where they hit their bottom and they accept help from other people. If, if they feel like I felt invincible and unwilling to accept help from other people, so cocky and so confident, they have to get to a position in their life where they feel like shit in order to say, hey, I'm going to make some changes. Now, what sort of slight influence could, you know, somebody have to not make it to rock bottom potentially who's a little bit different than me? Just get around better people. You know, have some more positive influences in your life, in your friend group and in the people that you hang around with and take a look at your life and say like, hey, is this really going to lead me down the life that I have set for myself? See, now for me, my thought process at the time would have been, well, of course I can do both. I can be this street kid, but I can also achieve what I want because I was delusional. So, but for anybody else that maybe not as delusional as I, it's like get in some better circles, you know, find some other people that are on a better path and start hanging out with more positive people. Yeah. I love that quote of like, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Yeah. And I think telling that if I told that to myself in high school, I would call this me an idiot and say, doesn't matter. I hang out with 40 people. I don't have a close five. Now, older, I have my like five people that I spend all the time with. And a lot of the success that I've had goes back to the time I've spent with them, learning, shooting ideas back and forward. So I love that that's your advice because I think that's something that anybody could do right now. It's totally. not that hard to go out 
obviously I don't want to be insensitive. It is hard to part ways with people that maybe you've spent a lot of your life with that aren't going down the right path, but going and finding quality individuals is something that I think we're lucky to have social media and that type of internet, like friendships that you can make that'll change your life where you meet people that you probably would have never met 20 years ago, but now you can go connect with, go meet in another city. So totally. It, most, most people don't realize that their initial friend group, 99.9% .9 of the people who become very successful do not still sh share the same core five people that they were friends with, say, in high school. It's, re it's extremely rare to see that. And I think that's the hardest thing is like, hey, but these are my friends and they grew up with me and they know my life and I'm going to be friends with them for the rest of my life. And it's like, that's not been my experience. You know, I've been very blessed to have some very close friends that ended up on the same path as me from college, but there's two of them. Yeah, it's, it's few and far between. Yeah. So you've had this really chaotic, start to your life here as an adult i mean you say as early as 13 but let's just say from 17 to 24 where things are crazy you when we were speaking off camera you said you've lived here five years now but you've been on and off 10 to 12 years what happened in that latter part of the time where you were still not a hundred percent on the right path that's, that's the best way to put it still not a hundred percent on the right path because I went to rehab for Oxycontin. So the feds were following us. We got apprehended. Um, they knew we were selling Oxycontin. They knew everything about us. Luckily, two weeks after that apprehension, I went to rehab. And I never did Oxycontin again after that. So I got really lucky. And the whole group kind of like broke up from there. You know, one of my buddies went to rehab in LA and ended up staying out there. Another one went on his own path. Four of the seven people died. You know, so yeah, not right away, but yeah, yeah. from, from all, all, pretty much all from overdose. Um, sad. So after I got out of rehab, I did my best to clean up my life. I met a couple of kids that were sober. Um, there was these two kids in town that were quite a bit older than me. I think maybe seven or eight years older than me, but they ran very successful businesses. They were just super dope kids. And one had already been sober for like nine or 10 years. And I couldn't believe it, you know, because he was a wild animal like into all the extreme sports and had like a bunch of houses and, and ATVs and dirt bikes. And he was just a badass motherfucker. He dated the hottest girls. And I was like, this kid definitely sells Coke. Like if he's, even if he's sober, he's selling drugs, you know, but he ran a legit auto body shop and he kind of, you know, helped me get into AA. And so I was going to AA a little bit more seriously, but I never stopped smoking weed and I never really stopped doing Xanax, maybe for like a six month period of time. And so I was always kind of high and on Xanax mm -hmm. and I progressed from the bank to, you know, still taking college courses, but I ended up starting to sell cars. And the second that I started selling cars, it was, it was, you know, my life, uh, financially and from a business perspective, it was on, I wasn't meant to work at a bank or be in finance, even though that's what I studied. Like I'm a salesman Yeah. and I just crushed it. Like the second that, and I became the top sales guy there right away. And then I was like, all right, I'm capped. I'm capped at like 150K. Maybe I could get to 200, but you know, in Vermont, that was decent and I was 25. And so I was like, all right, I'm doing okay here, but I got to get to the next level. And someone said, hey, you can be a financial advisor and, and you know, give investment advice and sell you know, insurance, life insurance. As so I said, well, how much can I make? And they're like, some kid made 800K here last year. You know? And I was like, all right, great, sign me up. Let's sign fucking me go, up. you know? And so I did that and it went incredibly well right away. Um, you know, I had a really good network of people and people that were wealthy and that actually were in a position to want, you know, either some financial advice or some life insurance. And I just crushed it right out of the gate. And uh, at that time, I was traveling with my buddies and going to LA, Miami, Mexico. A couple of my friends were getting married. And it was just a, it was a really fun time in life. My first year of financial advising, I think I was 25, 26. Um, I got connected, you know, reconnected with a bunch of kids in Miami and, and two of my best friends and I were down here for a trip in Miami. Uh, and it was just unbelievable. You know, I just loved it. Like first year was amazing. And then the second year I came back, maybe second or third year, we were here for Art Basel. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> uh, yeah, second year. 
my experience with Art Basel was we were at a club. It was uh, we were at Rockwell, which no longer exists. Yeah. And we were at a One Oak pop up, and we were there four nights in a row. The guy who we were with, uh, he ran like a business in LA, and he spent forty or fifty k each night on the tables. And for me, I was like, damn, this shit's crazy. That's why. And and mind you, I'm doing well at that point. You know, I'm making like a couple hundred racks doing financial advising. I'm helping my friends. Like, and I'm getting these checks. Like financial advising or the way that my shit was going, I'd get like a hundred K check and I'd be like, all right, I'm going to go, I'm going to go get a uh, Aston Martin. I'm going to get the penthouse at the one and I'm going to like blow 10, 15 racks on tables at story and live, you know, mm. like that was like year two. And so it was like, this is the fucking funnest time. And then I get to Art Basel and we meet this guy and I kind of see the next level, you know, and at the table next to us was, Le this was when LeBron was playing here. It was LeBron, J.R. Smith. Wiz Khalifa, Fabulous, Miguel. And then at the table next to us was Dan Bilzerian, like 50 girls, Nick Smith, like all these people. And I'm like, yo, this is heaven. You know? Yeah, you're living and, and, like and, the pinnacle here. The pinnacle, you know? And I have Molly, ketamine. I had a chemist at the time who used to make me the purest Molly. I had a, a vet in Peru that would send me liquid ketamine that we would cook, so pure, pure ketamine. And then I had a chemist that would make me this other shit. So I had all these drugs on me all the time. And I was just like the kid with the candy box, you know? So like, it was so like with girls and with everything, it was just fun. It was, it was the pinnacle, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I just started spending more and more time down here. You know, I went from like a week to 10 days to a couple of weeks to after the third or fourth year, there was like a month at a time where I was coming down here and I was still doing financial advising. So like I could work from anywhere, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so I did that and it was kind of just like a, it was a party four years, you know, not really any growth, but I wasn't getting in trouble. Yeah. I wasn't getting DUIs. I wasn't addicted to painkillers. I was just doing like the party drugs here and there. And that was my life, you know, for, for a period of time. Until I suppose, until I was 30. Yeah. So from base, to, yeah. So from 25 to 30, for those five years, I did that. And, uh, eventually I was like, okay, I got to move to Miami. Mm -hmm. Um, at that time, I, I left financial advising. I started a, a laptop wholesale company. Uh, so we started selling like a thousand laptops to Newegg, to BH Photo, to these places that were like right before Amazon was like as prominent as today. There was like some other websites where you could buy electronics on. Got it. Even like Best Buy. And I was just selling big lots of, of computers. And then as Amazon became more popular, no one was buying a thousand computers anymore because the price fluctuations on Amazon were so crazy and it was such a competitive landscape. Mm -hmm. So literally within six months, we went from like crushing these like big, you know, big check orders from these, um, you know, institutions to, hey, Amazon has changed the price game. We're going to hold off. So I'm like, ah, oh, fuck, what am I going to do? I'm just like, you know, what? I just need to get to Miami. Like, fuck being in Vermont. I'm going to go down to Miami. I come down here really without a plan. Mm -hmm. I just packed up all my shit and I was like, fuck it. I'm just going to get down there and I'll figure it out. So I get down here and one of my buddies is like, hey, I know this guy that owns a, a Land Rover dealership, Range Rovers. And I was like, all right, you know what? I'm just going to kind of bite the bullet and sell cars. Even though I was capable of a lot more, I was like, I'm just going to do this. And like, I'll meet somebody who's wealthy down here who buys a Range Rover and then I'll work with them. That was my thought process. So I start selling cars down here. And everyone at the dealership that I worked at was, was, you know, it's the car industry. You know, people like to do drugs and drink and party and have fun. And at the time, dude, I was still smoking weed, doing Xanax. And everyone's visiting me in Miami, right? They're coming down like on a Tuesday night and like, yo, we got tables here and there. Like, you got to come out. And I'm like, I can't. Like, no, dude, we haven't seen you in forever. So I would go out night after night after night. And it's very hard to stay awake on weed and Xanax. And there's only so many Cuban coladas that I can drink. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. like drinking these things back and I'm falling asleep at the club. So I'm like, all right, you know what? I guess I got to do some Coke. And mind you, I hated Coke. I even used to sell it and never did it. It's just, I have the adverse reaction. Mm. But for some reason, I thought it was the only thing that would keep me up. So I'm doing it. And most people probably don't know this feeling, but when you're just smoking weed, doing Xanax and blowing Coke without drinking, because right, I haven't drank at this point since 24. I gave that up and hadn't had a sip of alcohol. So you're sober, completely alcohol-free from 24 on, just all dry powder or weed. So I'm out night after night, like blowing coke, doing this, and eventually you get to this point where you're like, dude, this is horrible. You know, I'm waking up every day with these like just feeling terrible, and you're all clammy and coked out, and there's not enough Xanax and weed that you can possibly smoke to like bring you down to the mm -hmm. level where you need to be. 
So after like three months of doing this, I end up, um, I end up out multiple nights in a row and some strange events happen where like one time my buddy got in a fight with his girlfriend and he's like, Hey, we got to leave the credit. The table's already paid for like the bottles are on me. Just do whatever you want. And it was like her five friends. So now I'm sitting at a table by myself with five girls, you know, and they're like trying to get me to drink. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not going to drink. Then the next day I'm with like another group of people and some dude's girlfriend slips at the pool and I catch her and she like literally almost kills herself. And he comes over to me. He's like, bro, thank you for saving my girlfriend. We got to go. He's like, you want my table? And I look over and it's, I don't know these people. And it's another group of like seven girls and they're all smoking. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> twice yeah. in one day. This is at the SLS pool party. I'm like twice in one weekend. Like, all right, fine. So I go and I sit down with these girls. And at that point I was so coked out and I had like really lost all my resistance. This girl poured me a Grey Goose and pineapple and I just love Grey Goose and pineapple. Mm. And she like hands it to me and I was like, fuck it. So I drank it three days, just drunk again, you know, like after basically 10 years of not drinking, eight, nine years, whatever. So you're on a full bender. Right? I'm at, now I'm on a bender, bro. And I got all the drugs and these mm. girls are loving me. And I got a, I got a, I got a drug dealer in Miami who met who would meet me actually at the sls at that pool party and he had he used to meet me there before and dude he had like candy coated colored shit and it looked like santa claus he had like this huge beard and he would come and he would sit down i would get him in and he would sit down and he would pull all the shit out and all the girls would just like be like melt you know what i mean yeah. and so i was the fucking man i'm sitting there and again here i am thinking like wow this is the life so I'm at this pool party, and then the next day we go out. The next night we go out. We go to Wall, uh, the club in the W. We're leaving, and everyone's like, "Hey, we're gonna go to we're gonna go to 11." And I was like, "I'm not going. I'm I'm too tired." And and like, dude, I I used to get really drunk, but I would never lose my motor coordination. Mm -hmm. Like people wouldn't actually know I was that drunk, even yeah. like that. But this night, I was like swaying. You know, like I was fucked, and I can yeah. feel it because uh, all these drugs and all this drinking. And so I'm standing outside, and I call the Uber cancels call another uber it cancels the call the third one he can't find me forever for like 20 minutes and then he cancels and i'm like jesus like i know i'm fucked up but this is crazy so some silver ford fusion sedan pulls up some this girl says to me hey you need a ride down the beach and i was just like yeah i do for sure and she's like hop in i'm like all right great and i remember thinking like this maybe not the best idea but i'm so fucked up like maybe i could get a blow job and some and I'm like, oh, all right, let's go. So I do. She's fucking huge fingernail and she's just blowing coke. She's like, hey, you want some? And I'm like, absolutely. And she gives me some. And whatever she gave me was not coke. And it wasn't ketamine because, dude, I could do a gram of ketamine and still be totally fine. She gave me some sort of roofie, some sort of something. And I'm like, whoa, that hurt. What kind of coke is this? And she put another one here and I just sniffed it again. Dude, within 30 seconds, I just remember my whole world and face melted completely. And I just passed out and she jacked me for my watch and the rest of my jewelry and left me in the middle of uh, like Meridian by Flamingo Park. And I wake up like four hours later. I can still barely stand. My knees are all scraped up. So she leaves me with my phone. Uh, I'm able to call an Uber. I get home. But I'm like, oh my God, my watch is gone. And it was thankfully just- Thankfully she left your phone. I know, thankfully. You know, she was just really looking for the watch. I guess apparently this was like a scam that they run where they like- right in this area around the W, they wait for people at 2.30, 3 a.m. And if someone has a nice watch, they try and do this shit and then drug them. You know, I later found out through the police. But so it was a it was a watch that my dad had handed down to me when I was, I don't know, like a year before that maybe. And it was the sign that like I was doing okay in my life. To me, that watch meant like, hey, my dad finally thought like I'm not a fuck up anymore, you know? Yeah. And then the watch got stolen and I remember I called him as a like, dad, the watch, the watch got stolen. He's like, I don't give a fuck about a watch. He's like, but how did the watch get stolen? And I told him, he's like, you've been drinking again, haven't you? I was like, yeah. So he says to me, look, the way I see it, you have two choices. Either you can bounce in and out of AA for the rest of your life and be a fucking loser, or you can go to AA, work with a sponsor and do the 12 steps and you might have a chance at living a good life. My dad doesn't really know shit about AA. He just like read a little bit about it, but he's not an alcoholic or an addict whatsoever. After my dad said that, very next day I said, all right, I'm going to go to an AA meeting. So I looked up a meeting. I went to an AA meeting near me on South Beach. And the first guy that spoke 
like really just hit me and I was like, man, I, I really probably should be here, you know, similar story. And then the next night I went back and the guy like even it hit me even deeper, you know, I was like, holy shit. And I, I got their numbers and I started staying in touch with them. And every single night for that first week, I went to an AA meeting and I asked this one guy to be my sponsor. And, and he says to me, yeah, man, but you're going to have to really like do the work. You know, I, I, he, I told him my story and how I had kind of been familiarized with AA for the better part of like eight, nine years at that point. I had never really gotten sober. And he's like, yeah, dude, but I'm not going to take it easy on you because you obviously need this shit. Yeah. Like you're going to have to do what I tell you. And I was like, all right, fine, fuck it, man. And so, dude, he made me do everything. Like I met religiously with him every week. I did all the readings. I did all the steps. You know, he would make me get commitments to like bake cookies on a Saturday night at seven o'clock when like I used to be at the Mondrian, you know, like hanging out with all the all the dimes you know at the pool party and now i'm like going to bake cookies at a at a 7 p.m young people's meeting you know I'm like, fuck this dude i had a coffee commitment on sunday mornings i had i had to go pick up all these kids from the from the sober living house and bring them to meetings and i'm like dude this is crazy man like i don't have enough time for this shit and he's like you don't have enough time for fucking anything bro you ruined your fucking life like the shit that you have time for fucking brought you to this point. So you shut the fuck up and do it. And it, it was what I needed at the time. You know, he was a little bit softer than that, but basically that's exactly what he said. That's powerful. And so dude, I just did it. You know, for that first year, I didn't miss one day. I went to an A meeting every single day and I picked kids up and I kept my commitments and I worked with him and I started sponsoring other guys and I took the shit really serious, you know, and that first year was tough. I, uh, I wasn't talking to girls. I was just like focusing on myself and I got sober and I built a foundation. I built a really strong network of people. Uh, halfway through the year, I was still selling cars and dude, imagine this. I get sober. I can't hang out with any of my old friends in Miami cause they all like party and whatever. So now I'm with a completely new network of people. I'm still selling cars at the dealership. I'm making no fucking money. I want to kill myself. Uh, and I finally meet this woman who's like, got a financial uh, company she sells uh, financial data and she's like hey i'm going to start a financial technologies company um what are your thoughts on this and i had a lot of thoughts on it because i had been reading a lot and i had a finance background and she was like wow you would be perfect to like run this company with me and i was like done like get me out of here get me out of here get me out of here and she's like great and so this is that my friends always say this like you live this charmed life you know and so like yes i've had some really really fucked up times and trying you know and I think a lot of the pain and struggle that I've been through um, kind of leads its way into some of these interesting experiences that I had. But she basically says like, hey, let's let's run this company together. I split time between here and LA. When I'm not here, why don't you stay at my house in Fort Lauderdale? You had like a $10 million house on the water with jet skis and boats and fucking. She's like, stay here with one of my dogs, you know? And so, dude, I'm running this company. It's me and her. And I'm just hanging out at this $10 million crib in Fort Lauderdale. You know, so for the next like six, six to eight months, that's what I was doing. Again, I'm like, all right, great. I'm making a good living. Everything's going really well. We create a, a, we create a, an app where a consumer can rearrange their bad debt without having to go to collections or have a, a, a law firm process a judgment against them. So they can say, okay, MasterCard, you know, I have, I'm three months past doing my credit card bill. I can log into this app and I can negotiate the amount of debt that I pay back, the payment terms, and then I can potentially rearrange the rest of my bad debt through consolidation and and personal loans and whatever it is. And so we would provide this foundation where they could do this without ever having to talk to somebody. So now instead of MasterCard selling off their debt at 7%, they're probably going to recapture. We had a way to prove they could recapture 20 to 25% which if MasterCard's writing off 7% of a billion dollars, this is a way, for, like, we created a legit company, and MasterCard's like, yo, this shit's legit. Yeah. Well, right before I sold the Land Rover to her, I sold a Land Rover, a Range Rover to a guy who was the VP of operations, MasterCard North America. So, bro, I got the connect, and this guy yeah. loves me, you know, and so I'm like, yo, we're going to sell it to MasterCard. So we start having meetings, we start having meetings. Everything's going great. I'm out in Vail skiing with my buddies. And it's March 17th and the fucking Chinese flu, coronavirus flashes on the TV and all my friends like, yo, what is this shit? And then the next day they're like, hey, Val Mountain is shutting down everyone. You need to leave. Like this shit's serious. And I'm like, shit, get the fuck out of here. You know, fucking Chinese flu. This is a joke. And my dad calls me. He's like, bro, you better get back home. Like, what are you going to do? I'm like, I'm going to stay in LA for a while. Like we're hanging out. 
He's like, no, man, like you better get home. So I get home. I get home and she calls me and she's like, wait, like I know a lot of people in, in politics, like they're talking about extending forbearance, like so nobody has to pay back loan interest. So of course, MasterCard is not going to move forward with the solution yeah. when no one has to pay back their debt anymore. And, the, and three days later, the government said, everyone's off the hook for three months. And my boy at MasterCard's like, bro, put this on pause. So two months go by. And then he's like, bro, they just extended forbearance another three months. Like, not not on our radar anymore. Remember, the world was like blowing up. He's like, we're not going to focus on this right yeah. now at all. I'm like, fuck. And she's like, hey, I'm going to focus on my personal information company. I'm not, let's just shut the doors on this. I'm like, all right, fuck. So here I am, two months into COVID. No idea what I'm going to do. Fucking, I'm ass again. Like, this thing fell apart. And I'm like, oh my God. Luckily, during this period of time, from probably my first three months into sobriety, I got a mentor who also had overcome drug and alcohol addiction, but he was a very, very proficient businessman, a stoic, had an incredible family. I valued everything about this guy. He had had an incredibly difficult life. We were the same in so many different ways, and I just really vibed with him. And luckily, when this happened, I just leaned on him, and I spent a lot of time with him. And he helped me identify what it is that I want to do. He helped me find my purpose. He, he helped me get closer to God and spend a lot of time in meditation and start to read. I had never read a book before that. Fucking before I was 31 years old, bro, 32 years old, I never read a book in my whole life. That's crazy. I told my third grade teacher, listen, lady, I don't know what you can teach me that I don't already know. <laughs> that was my mindset. You know? Yeah. Like I was just very closed minded. And so he helped open my mind to what was next. And I end up getting a job offer at a striker selling um, orthopedic devices. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just about to take the offer and I'm like, oh, fuck, I don't want to go into the hospitals and doctor's office and give them donuts and try and jump up relationships like fuck this and i hate the traditional medical system anyway yep. because i had just overcome an autoimmune disorder not through the bullshit prescription that the doctors gave me but through changing my nutrition and some of my exercise and some of my habits and so i'm like fuck that like okay what's what's this functional medicine you know like what else is there so i start looking at functional medicine and I'm, you know, praying and meditating and I don't know how to get into it. I don't really know what it is. I don't know shit about hormones. But randomly out of the blue, my buddy says to me, hey, I just met a guy that owns a hormone clinic up in Aventura. He's about to close the doors because nobody's coming into the business anymore. And I'm like, oh, okay, so why are you telling me this? And he's like, well, the guy still thinks there's a chance, but he needs a sales manager to kind of help him grow the business. You should go up and talk to him. I'm like, all right. So I go up, I meet with this guy. And he's like, hey, look, like, I'm probably not actually going to shut the doors. I just need to figure out a way to, like, transition this business. And I'm like, dude, you sell hormones, right? Like, telemedicine? He said, yeah. I said, I just read an article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday that said that they're relaxing telemedicine laws. And now, instead of just in Florida, you can prescribe to all 50 states. You know that, right? And he's like, yeah, but how do we scale across all 50 states? And I'm like, bro, I can help you with all of that, like, marketing and sales. Like, I can create all these funnels, all these buyer personas, all these leads, I can, you know, what's your sales team like? And he tells me, and it's a bunch of like Fred Flintstone dinosaurs with the most antiquated sales process ever. Mm. Still dialing numbers individually, not using the CRM properly, not with the right script. They don't understand question-based framework. They don't understand who their buyer is. They're unwilling to grow. Like, and I'm like, bro, I, give me a chance. And he's like, but you haven't managed salespeople before and you haven't led marketing at any, you've been a sales guy, you know? Yeah, you were a financial advisor and you started this company, but you're a sales guy. I'm like, dude, just give me a chance. So he says, you're going to start as a sales guy and we'll see how you do in three months. And all I can think is I'm going to be a fucking sales manager within the first week and I'm going to show this guy. So I'm like, all right, fine. So I, I become a sales guy there and I very quickly outsell everyone within the first three weeks. And then after three weeks, he's like, okay, I want you to start leading sales meetings. I'm like, bro, I'm not, I'm not going to be on a commission-based plan as a sales guy and leading these guys. It's one or the other. Like, it's time to make me the sales manager. He said, okay. So after three weeks, sales manager. That's quick. Now I got to go in and manage these Fred Flintstone, old school, antiquated, fixed mindset guys who know more about medicine, functional medicine, and hormones than I do. And like, who is this fucking young kid who sold cars and finance before fucking coming in to like teach us? And I'm like, all right, I got my fucking work cut out for me. Mm -hmm. So I go in into the first morning meeting and Mark's like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to sit with you in the first couple morning meetings. And I'm like, Mark, you got one week to sit with me. And then after that, let me bond with these guys. Let me figure out what drives them. You're not going to, you, 
this isn't your forte. So he sits with me for a week. And then the next week, I remember this was like the happiest time. I sit down and I go, have you ever seen the movie Blow? I have not. Okay, well, George Young teaches these guys in jail. Basically, he's got to teach them half the time about something real. And he says to them, hey, listen, I'll make a deal with y'all. Half the time, I'm going to teach you about this George Washington character. And the other half the time, I'm going to teach y'all how to smuggle drugs. Right? And all the inmates light up, right? They're like, fuck yeah, we love you now. And so I went in there and I said to these guys, hey, listen, guys, half the time, I'm going to do what Mark wants to do and teach you guys the sales process. And the other half of the time, I'm going to show you exactly how to fucking double your income without having to do as much work. How's that sound? And they were all like, okay, we'll consider this. So I'm like, all right, the first thing that y'all are going to do is you're going to learn to meditate. And they're like, what? <laughs> the oh, fuck is wrong with you? That sounded they're that. like, dude, meditate. What the fuck is this? I'm like, all right, before we meditate, I want to understand who each of you are. So tell me about each of you. And I want to understand each of your goals and why you want them. So we went around the room, we did it. And I understood each of them. And then I taught them how to meditate. And after one week, dude, they were addicted to the meditation and what it was doing for their mind. And then I started saying, okay, based on who each of these people are, now I understand how to motivate them, what their hot buttons are. Mike just wants some more time with his wife. He wants some more time off. Hamilton, he just wants to make fucking three X. You know, this guy over here, he wants to increase his leads, but he wants to, he wants to just whale hunt. He wants the bigger dogs instead of the little shit. And this kid over here will take anything. He doesn't give a fuck. He's just hungry. So now I understand these guys. Now I'm going to change their incentive a little bit. I'm going to figure out what their biggest pain points are. And I go into the business. I basically take an audit of everything. I go back to the business owner, Mark, and he's like, hey, so what'd you find out? And I was like, we got a little bit of work to do. And he's like, well, what do you think you can do it? And I was like, yeah, but look, and this was only after two months. I said, I want my comp plan to change already. Based off of certain revenue metrics, I want a tiered percentage based off of what I do because I have a belief that I can 3X this business. And he said, if you could do that, you you basically can tell me what you want your structure to be. I said, okay, boom. So again, working with my mentor, I created a comp package. I changed everything. These guys' mindset. The, I told them, unbutton your, untuck your fucking shirts. Stop wearing belts and, and wingtip shoes. Wear sneakers. I'm going to start playing Future and Yo Gotti. And we're going to fucking have some fun here. You know, like come into work expecting to have fun. Yes, you're going to have to do some role playing, some shit that you don't like but I'm going to teach you guys how to meditate and I'm going to help you understand how to close higher ticket sales. Right. And so I started doing that while I was coaching them and teaching them, they're closing more deals, higher ticket sales. And when they're having a difficulty, they're calling me over and I'm fucking just lopping people over the head. Like I'm talking like getting $30,000 orders and they're like, how are you doing this? And so I'm showing them in person and teaching them and coaching them. Everything's going better. I mean, these guys went from like, one of them was making 120,000 when I went there and in one of the latter months, he made like 300, uh, he was on pace to make 340,000 for the year, you know, like a, a, whole, a whole different thing. Right. Yeah. So I, these guys had so much buy-in with me, you know, they were like, I fucking love you. And so I'm doing this, I do this for six months and I'm like, all right, I say to the business owner, like, bro, it's time for me to take over marketing now. I'm going to start managing the marketing people. I'm going to help you redo the website. I'm going to show you how to understand your buyer personas. And we need to integrate sales and marketing together because you're not doing that right now. The message on the website, the marketing material and the collateral is based off of your copywriter going online, researching this type of industry and hormone replacement and writing articles based off of what he's reading. That doesn't mimic what the sales guys are saying. That doesn't mimic your brand voice. That doesn't mimic your view and your stance on medicine and hormones. So we need to bring the copywriter into the sales meetings and we need to dictate to him what we want the brand voice to be and how we are promoting this and selling this on the phones so that there's no, you know, there's no lack of congruency between the marketing message and the sales scripts. Now, if the marketing message is now aligned with what the salespeople are saying, operations must deliver on exactly what marketing says and exactly what sales says. So we need to create one cohesive unit so I bring the operations director in and she's like, yeah, Wade, but I'm here for compliance. I just don't want the business to fail. And I say, I go to the business owner. I say, listen, Mark, if you really want this shit to change and you want to stop having a fucking separated culture with a lot of bullshit and a lot of gossip and a shitty fucking customer journey, we need to incentivize the operations manager to have a percentage of revenue. And he's like, okay, if you can do it, fine. So now I educate the operations manager on what the on, on how revenue and profitability and how everything is created 
on leads and how you spend money on marketing and everything. I educate her day after day after day. She starts to buy in. Now she loves me because I'm teaching her something and I've changed her comp package, right? So now all of a sudden I say to, to the business owner, bro, I need to run this company. I need to be the director of growth. You can call me whatever the fuck you want to call me, but I need to manage sales, marketing operations, the whole thing. Right before I went to do that, we find a CFO that comes into the, to the company, a fractional CFO, and he's been a, an amazing business associate of mine ever since. But the last thing that we needed was to clean up the, the finance, the, the financials. Mm -hmm. So he comes in right when I'm taking over sales and marketing. And I said, but I need your help creating better KPIs and cleaning up all these financial metrics. Now, this kid was pretty next level. You know, like he was above and beyond my scope at that point because he had prepared multiple companies for sale. Okay. So he knew how to take companies from cash accounting to accrual accounting and prepare them for sale. So that private equity wanted to buy them. And so he comes in and we start working together. And dude, we went from in a year and a half, this company was at 4 million when I started and we ended up at 12 million in a year and a half. So 3X growth in a year and a half from losing 500K the first year to 1.5 or 1.7 million profitable at the end of the time. So this business owner is like, wow, holy shit, you guys are awesome, you know? And I'm going up and up and up. And like, now I'm over 500K and I'm just like, this is fucking great. Like, we're having good years, everything's going great. So now I'm considering buying the company and I'm trying to do my due diligence and figure out how much this company is actually worth. And if I buy this company, will it align with my goals? And this was the thing that was a little bit crazy to me because at the time I was like, this is a no brainer. I'm gonna buy this company. I know the guy, I know he wants 7 million for it. I can easily raise that between my couple friends. You know, they were all at that point, like, holy shit, bro. We want to invest in you. Mm. Even if the terms aren't the best for us, for this business, like we want to invest in you. You are on fire. Like you just taught yourself medicine. You took over this company. Like we watched what you did and it's unbelievable. You just work 18 hours a day and you are, you are like an incredible sponge. Not to mention while I was running this company, the business owner had another company that helped doctors grow their practice through marketing and sales strategies. And they would come in for events and he would have me speak at the events. And then I would consult one-on-one -on -one with these doctors and he would give me a cut. So now I get visibility into how all these functional medicine doctors around the country are running their practice and what their inadequacies are. And each and every one of them would sit with me and be like, holy shit, nobody else that we've worked with understands how to create the buyer journey how to sell the patient, but also have their best medical interest in mind and not make it seem like we're, we're selling them. Like this is masterful. And that's my whole deal is, you know, question-based framework, consultative selling, never being super pushy. You're kind of like the Hormozy of, of the medical industry. hundred percent. Right. And I love, I, I love his closer based framework because that's how I used to sell, you know, that, that exactly what he talks about is how I would teach my salespeople to sell. I wouldn't create a script with a lot of language. I would create an outline and a framework of questions. And then I would help them dig deep to psychologically find someone's pain points. And once we have the pain points and we've overviewed them, then we want to ask them how much they know about our solution, consistently asking questions so that we're never talking over somebody. We never want to assume that somebody doesn't know something. And I would always tell them, guys, if you're dealing with rich people, I want you all to assume that they know more than you do about the fucking product that you're selling. And so when you assume that, I want you to then ask them, what is your familiarity with this product and what we do? And do you know the next steps? Once you have their permission to tell them what they're going to do next and you understand their pain points, now you can masterfully educate them about what we do and about how it's different than the other people in the industry. And so I would create this very comprehensive sales process because I would have my sales guy. Every month, they would have to shop a new hormone clinic. They would have to, they, I made them all create fake Gmail addresses, fake names, and they would submit leads to hormone clinics around the country. And they would have the sheet where they would have to fill out about how long they spend with the salesperson and what they told them and what their prices are and everything. So we had this competitive analysis of a hundred hormone clinics across the country. And now I could take all that data as well as all the frequently asked questions or objections that my salespeople were getting. And I would put them into a document and I would have the content guy write content about the frequently asked questions, the competitors in the industry, and then I would weave that into our sales scripts with them but they, so that when they educate, they're educating them based on things that we do that other people don't do that they're looking at. So the, our close rate went from like 7% to 33%. We just fucking mashed people. That's insane. Like for salespeople that are listening, 
a 33% close rate on a product like that is nuts. Insane. The average the, the average order value was $4,300. One, one order. You know, that's a six-month order. But still, so to have, you know, the, the one-year order value of, of almost $7,000, we increased everything. Like all of our metrics got better as a result of this, this new sales process. That, you know, so, but I, I'm at this point where I'm like, okay, I'm thinking about buying this company and I go do my due diligence. And I go back to my mentor and I'm like, look, this guy wants 7 million. He's like, well, how big do you think you can get this company based on where it's at and scaling and so forth? Now, when you're talking about hormone replacement or functional medicine, the majority of the sale is predicated on the doctor's prescription of the medicine. So if they prescribe certain hormones and treatments, that's the max amount of revenue that can be driven through that patient. So you're always going to be limited and bottlenecked by the doctors getting on the phone and going over the reviews and also being able to abide by what you want as a medical system or record of prescription. Now, getting doctors to limit their ego and prescribe in a way that's conducive to the business driving revenue instead of what they, it's always a problem. And I knew this in the back of my head, and like in order to really get this thing to scale large and massive, it's gonna be very, very difficult to find that many doctors that are gonna suppress their ego and work for you at like a sort of nominal pay to get this thing going. And so I said to Steve, like, look, there's no way we can get this business over 50 million, you know, from, from, we were at 12 million. I said, there's no way we get over 50. He said, well, remember the vision board that we had, you said in 10 years, you wanted to have a $200 million personal exit. So is you acquiring this business aligned with your 10 year goal? And I was like, no. And he said, okay, well, there's your answer. Like, let's move on. Yeah. It's like, all right. So I pass. Three weeks later. I get a call from Natalie Dawson. This is Brandon Dawson's wife. Brandon is business partners with Grant Cardone. Now, recently they had acquired Gary Brecca and Streamline Medical. Gary was and still is one of the top functional medicine providers. He's not a doctor, but he had doctors on staff and he had created this practice. His treatments and his philosophies are just next level. And I had been watching this guy and seeing him. I just didn't realize that Grant had acquired him and created 10X Health. But I had been seeing a little bit of this and I get the call and they're like, hey, we want to meet with you. And I'm like, holy shit. You know, this is crazy. Like, what, what, what had happened? What had actually happened was during my time at this company called Health Gains, I told you how I personally developed each of these yep. employees. One kid was a registered nurse and he said, Wade, I want to make more money. And I said, you got to become a sales guy, a wellness advisor. And he says, oh, I've never sold anything before. I said, but you can if you follow me. He says, okay. So he's making 85,000 a year as a nurse. I bring him into the sales team. He starts doing really well. He's having a lot of fear and he's not following up with people and he's trying to give everybody discounts and he's afraid. And I'm like, okay, bro, let's unpack this. Where does this fear come from? And I start working with this kid and I start actually figuring out how he communicates with his family and his girlfriend and what other places he's afraid to tell people the truth for fear of being judged. And I find that he's doing it over and over again with his family and his girlfriend. And I say, look, Jay, can you understand and, and see the association between your fear of being judged and you being a people pleaser and consistently not telling people what they need to hear and you not following up and trying to give everybody a discount? And he started to draw the line. I said, look, before we work on your sales process, let's work on how you communicate with your family and your girlfriend. So, dude, he starts doing this and his girlfriend starts respecting him more. He starts, you know, getting more respect from his family. Then he starts closing more deals and he stops discounting. And so from me personally developing this kid, he becomes a fucking unstoppable force. Ends up doing 250K in a year. He's the second sales guy to the guy who made, you know, 340 or whatever. I'm like, bro, your life's, you're, you're crushing it. Comes in my office one day crying. He goes, bro, I really hate to do this to you. But uh, two years ago, I applied to be a firefighter at the Fort Lauderdale Fire Department. And they just called me and they said that uh, I've been accepted and I got my dream job. I'm like, bro, how much are you going to make? He's like 120, but I only have to work four days and remember it's my dream job. I'm like, bro, I just fucking changed your life. And he's like, I know, but I'm going to do it. I'm really sorry. And I was like, no problem, bro. All love. This has been a great ride. You're a fucking killer. Stay in touch. I love you. Yeah. Well, he ends up on the side doing IVs for 10X Health for Gary Brecca and Grant and all them. And he fucking tells them that he knows this guy who just literally took a clinic just like theirs from 4 million to 12 million and restructured. He audited and restructured the entire company and that, well, we got to meet this kid. Yeah. So perfect. I get that call, you know? And so it was a result of really spending time and personally developing someone and, you know, changing the structure of this company. And I get that call. 
And that's how I ended up becoming president of, of 10X Health. Let's take a quick second from the episode to talk about our sponsor, Micromedia. Micromedia is responsible for all the editing of this podcast and all of our short form content for this podcast as well. Micromedia and the team is amazing to work with, and they're responsible for making our podcast look amazing. They help us distribute all of the short form all over our social media platforms to reach as many people as possible. If you're looking for someone to edit your podcast, do short form for your podcasts, or just short form in general, Micromedia is the number one option on the market right now. Feel free to reach out to us or just reach out to Micromedia on socials or online. Um, but they are responsible for all of this amazing work and have been nothing but great to work with. Now back to the episode. I mean, holy shit. Yeah, like it was a this whole ride here of you. One, just becoming this like full operator, going from like just being a car salesman to completely gutting an already operating business restructuring it going kind of business unit by business unit mentoring building up the right people being able to identify who you needed to put time into and it all comes full circle with the one younger person that you gave the energy and time to you didn't need to right you didn't need to go deep the business was probably still doing 12 mil a year without him doing anything right but you went out of your way to help this person and then it comes full circle maybe this is a long shot but does your past and your time in AA of learning to put all this energy into people and be invested in people, do you think that had a lot to do with you getting that opportunity? Totally. So, so I mean, I've always been someone who wants to reciprocate value for others because I feel good when doing so. But being a drug uh, addict and alcoholic, you become extremely selfish. And when I got into AA, I started to realize that the root of all my problems as learned in the program is extreme selfishness and self-centeredness. So to be rid of my problem, I need to have a spiritual experience, a reliance upon a power greater than myself, and I need to help others. And so as I was going through this program more and picking up those kids from the acceptance house and baking fucking cookies and helping the less fortunate and speaking at meetings and mentoring other people, I started to see the benefits of being selfless and helping others, and it started to rub off in other places in my life. And I also started to, I, I, I suppose I always knew, I was, I've been blessed enough to have the bigger vision of like, hey, if I win the respect of these people and if I help them all, this will come back to me in some form or another. Like I believe in karma and I really believe that I had been paying a, a large amount of karmic debt for years because of how fucked up I lived my life. And once I got a day and I started helping other people, I noticed that things started getting better and better and better. And I became addicted to helping other people because of what it did for my life and how I felt. And so, yeah, I was at that point where I was just like, I had been helping so many people. I'm going to fucking make this kid my use case. And it went amazing. But then look what happened, you know? But I, I could have easily stuck my head in the sand and say, bro, fuck you. Can you, I, I can't even believe you. Like I just spent all this time with you and helped you. And now you're going to go take a job slide in polls. Like what the fuck? But yeah. instead I was like, bro, all love. It's all going to be good. And t two months later, I get the call. It's crazy. Like I get the chance to interview people like yourself and talk about these moments and go deep. And it always blows me away that a life changing moment was decided by two to three minutes where you just decided it could have been a bad day. You could have gone rear ended on the way to work that day. And that kid comes and drops that news on you and you go off on him and you treat him the wrong way. And the opportunity doesn't present itself. It's just crazy the way that life works. Dude, so I worked on that a lot because what you're saying is a real issue that I had during my journey. And that was a lack of emotional intelligence to be able to consistently motivate my team when they weren't doing the right things or when life presented challenges for myself and I wasn't in a great mood. I started to realize how much of an effect I had at everyone at work and that I was the leader. And if that my mood was off, everyone's mood was off. Yep. And if they did something I didn't like and I snapped at them and, and was sarcastic and condescending, they would fucking pack it in for weeks. And dude, that happened to me early on, right? I wasn't incredibly altruistic or calm or patient early on. I, I was very raw and yes, I taught them to meditate and luckily my meditation had allowed me to 
be okay and not judge my thoughts. But it took some serious practice and work with my mentor and other people to manage people better. And I actually used to do this exercise where I would wake up and I would think to myself, what situations are going to happen today when I go into work? I'm going to get there and my operations manager is going to be bitching about something that the sales guy did. Okay, how am I going to respond to that situation? Well, I could blow up on her and tell her to shut the fuck up like I used to do, you know? Or I could work with her and say, okay, let me just help better understand the problem a little bit. Let me get all the information as much as possible. Let me formulate a solution and then let me talk to the guys. And that would win her confidence, right? So now I've projected, here's the two ways I can do it. And then I would rehearse doing it the right way. So that when I would get to work, I would already have rehearsed and figured out my approach to the situation. And I started saying, who pisses me off at work and what do they usually do? Hamlet, the sales guy, he's going to come to my office and say, these leads suck. These operations, people aren't doing what I want them to do. And then I would say, okay, how am I going to handle this situation? This guy would tell me that the leads are shit. This guy would tell me that, you know, whatever. And so I would start to plan out the day and say, okay, here's how I'm going to handle the situation. So that when they, when they, when they came into my office, instead of fucking losing it, I would say, oh, I've already seen the situation and I've already responded in my head. And I'd say, hey, buddy, no problem. I totally get where you're coming from. <laughs> I'd probably be more upset than you are right now. I know operations is a little all over the place, but look, we're a team and I'm working with them just like I'm going to work with you and here's what's going to happen. And dude, it just started inspiring trust in people. And so as a result, things stopped throwing off my day. And I think this is actually what a lot of people miss is that if you can regulate your emotions and consistently have a positive mindset, regardless of the exterior, regardless of the people in your life, regardless of what's going on, you allow the opportunity to take full advantage of situations because otherwise you're going to be in a position where if Jay came into my office and told me that, and I was in that negative mindset, I would have probably brushed him off. And who knows what could have happened that day. It could have been a multitude of different things that in the past would have put me in a shitty situation, but my ability to handle and manage life put me in a position where I started taking advantage of opportunities. And that's what I noticed through my growth, through my discipline, through meditation, through you know, exercise, breath work, the whole deal is that opportunities started presenting themselves because I was prepared and I was in the right emotional state. Yeah, I've heard that actually a lot recently that people are explaining, like, if you prepare yourself and set yourself up for the opportunities, you won't miss them. Most people, opportunities go right by them and they weren't even ready to accept them, so they never saw them. Yeah, People like yourself who have started to become very calculated leave a lot of open area for you to take advantage of something like that. Like I think of somebody who wouldn't be calculated, they'd be all invested in their day to day trying to, everything is like onto the next. It's just like on the fly. Like, how am I going to handle this now? Where if everything's super calculated, you're able to kind of like a ninja, just slice through objections all day long. And then when that one big opportunity pops up, you don't miss it because you're perfectly aware. And I think this is a great example of that. And for people listening, the ability to start to understand where the flaws and faults in your day may be, like you just said, are such a big differentiator. And, and in my life, I feel the same way. Like I already know what objections I'm going to get in my sales job. I already know what customers are going to complain about. And like before, it felt like, it was nonstop and I was all over the place. But then I started to get a good formula around it and things started to change. So I love hearing your perspective from that. Self-awareness is the first key for sure. And then taking a look at, hey, what are my flaws? What doesn't belong? And then the third thing is recognizing that most situations that happen in your life are not unique. They are a pattern of circumstances that is going to continue to happen. And if you can adapt to that circumstance and say, hey, this is going to continue to happen in the future, this characteristic, this personality type, this problem, they're all similar in sorts. Now I need to learn how to package how I'm going to respond to these type of people in these situations. Life just becomes so much easier. You know, and a lot of people don't, and I certainly didn't look at themselves as a business, but if you look at a business and we have meetings every week and we say, Hey, what are our KPIs and how are we doing against them? What, what's our key performance indicator? What's our metric? And how do we do, do we do that with ourselves? No, a lot of times people don't take a look at like, hey, how am I doing? Did, did I let my emotions get the best of me? And did I blow up on somebody? Did I handle that situation like I could have? Did I automate this system or did I continue to do it manually and say that this business can't scale without me? Like, 
Did I work on my relationships? No. And if not, then like we need to take a good hard look at this. I think it's difficult for people because you have to suppress your ego and you have to be willing to say, hey, I'm going to I'm going to objectively look at my life and I'm going to get feedback from someone else who has solved these problems and actually accept help and work on myself. But if you can make your life personally like a business, of course, we can get better because we'll track it and then we'll optimize. So that's been key for me. You go with the 10x health route. That opportunity presents itself. What was it like working with Gary? What was it like scaling that operation? Because now it's a household name. Over the last six months, Dana White's put it on the map. And I know a lot of celebrities were going beforehand, but I think now more and more people are, are starting to understand. What was that experience like? It was a blessing. You know, I mean, Gary taught me more about medicine than anyone else has. I learned a lot from Gary about simplifying the message of anything that you're explaining. He has an, an, an unbelievable way of explaining high level topics at a very simple level and making incredible analogies. He also has an amazing passion for, for helping people. So I just got so blessed to, to be able to work with him. You know, when I, when I went to 10 X, this is actually very interesting. So I told you I was going to buy this company that I had just built called health gains. I decided instead to go work for 10X. And when they initially interviewed me, they said, so um, here's a couple of things that we're working on and what are your suggestions for this? And I said, my suggestion is that you guys buy the company that I just built because we just built a sales team, a marketing engine, an operational vehicle, and a technology platform that, that can plug into 10X Health and help you scale more quickly. So they said, okay, we're gonna acquire that company. So within three weeks of me being the president of 10X Health, we sent a letter of intent, an LOI to the business owner and I had already told him when I left, I said, hey, we're going to buy this. Don't worry. 10X is going to buy this. You're a company. Within three months, we acquired that company and then we integrated the company I just built. All of those people that I had personally developed and worked with, when I left, they were crying and three months, and I couldn't talk to them. I was under an NDA that said I couldn't talk to them because we were in the process of buying them. Three months later, I walked back in with Brandon Dawson, now the president of a company five times larger. And Brandon walks in with me and says, Hey guys, I'm Brandon Dawson. I own 10X Health. We're with Gary Brecca and Grant Cardone. Wade is the president of this company. As many of you might know, we've just acquired you. I don't have really an operating role per se day to day. Wade will answer and handle all questions and everything for the company. So now I leave the company. People are crying. Now I'm the president of a larger company that just acquires them. And it was like, people start crying, dude. Cause now like the old vibe is back and like, they're just like so happy, you know? And so now I get to integrate my entire team into 10x which is a whole nother thing in itself integrating up one company into the other was the biggest learning process i've i've ever been through it's it's a challenge you know especially because that company and the way that we built it wasn't exactly how gary and his his team were operating gary was operating at a very high level with high level patients vip concierge service and it was it was very different from the rest of the structure of the business which was be able to help patients in all 50 states at scale yeah. Right, so now I have to merge these two companies, and and it was, it was you know very very difficult. Um, but I mean, yeah, working with him was crazy. It's just mind blowing to me that you have had all of these insane experiences in your life. You've gotten more opportunities than I think I've ever heard of. Just mess up, get back out. Mess up, get back out. And now we're all the way here 15 years later from the 15 year old you and you're acquiring companies you're the president of a multi-million dollar business you're building companies at scale not a regional scale a countrywide scale in what world did you think that that was possible i've always had grandiose visions of myself somewhat you know, delusional visions of myself, but I never knew somebody that could help me understand scale at a larger level. As soon as I met my mentor, I had this feeling of I'm going to be okay. And, and this is why I have a coaching program now. And this is why I mentor people. And, and a lot of people think like, well, why do you have a coaching program? Or like, isn't that like babysitting people? It's like, guys, I went from a car salesman to the president of 10X Health, helping business owners grow and scale, working with Brandon at Cardone Ventures. We acquired multiple companies and we integrated them. I've seen and prepared companies for sale 
Now I understand private equity and I have my own companies across many different industries. That didn't happen in a three-year period of time without working one-on-one -on -one with a highly qualified mentor. In fact, multiple. Every single night after work, I was reaching out to people that understood marketing and digital media, working with my mentor on business structure, finance, private equity, how to structure a deal, how to understand my leverage, how to move up, when to have these conversations, how to have these conversations. Every single week at 7 a.m., I was with my mentor. Saturday mornings, 7 a.m., working one-on-one, -on -one, asking him questions, going on a walk, playing tennis, having breakfast. And so that accelerated the curve for me tremendously. So for anyone else out there, like, you don't know what you don't know along the journey and you don't even know what to ask Google or ChatGPT or any of these things. But if someone else who's been through it, who's willing to help you, has the knowledge to help you with exactly where you're at, dynamic feedback of read this book now, check this podcast out, here's this information, do this research, do this. My journey was accelerated because I had the entire framework and feedback of this guy who, you know, aside from my parents, no one has ever changed my life like this, you know? And from a business perspective, this guy accelerated my life so fast. It's fucking insane what he helped me do and helped me learn. And that's why I've been so successful. Yeah, and, and mentorship, I've always been a big advocate for it. One of my old businesses was a mentorship type program for the niche that I was in. And I it wasn't my most profitable business, but it was my most fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And I always recommend anybody Go get a mentor, but be very intentional about who you pick. Don't just pick the guy with the most followers that you think is living the cool lifestyle. Totally. Be intentional about who you're picking. And I like how much you highlight, whether it was a sponsor in AA, all the way to a business mentor individual, how much that's impacted your journey. And I agree, it's an accelerator. You can go the prideful route and figure it out on your own, but it's going to take you probably double the time. And Put your pride to the side. Go work with people who are very qualified in their field. Be a sponge. Learn. Try and get better. And this is the product. You are the product of what that recipe will create. And I think for people listening, it's such a good example because you've done so many things wrong, but then you've done so many things right. And the right has clearly beaten the wrong here. And you've now created this program and that's what kind of the last topic I want to go through is we've talked about your whole journey up until now, but now it's you, Wade is the brand, and you are giving back to individuals. How does it feel? What does the coaching program entail? Because maybe somebody listening might be interested in getting in touch with you for it. Totally. It's um, it's a my, my coaching program is a culmination of every problem that I've overcome in my life and the solution and blueprint that I've formulated to be able to consistently overcome those problems and maintain discipline and consistency through my life. So many coaches will help people with business or with fitness or with mindset. Look, I've overcome drug addiction, overdose, judicial consequences, lack of confidence, not making as much money, sabotaging my life, autoimmune disorders, uh, you know, reckless behavior, getting fired from jobs, uh, being, you know, emotionally unintelligent, uh, being extremely unhealthy. Dude, I see McDonald's every single morning. I used to smack two, two packs of cigarettes. I used to smoke. I, I, I have overcome so many issues. Not to mention, I've changed my mindset through meditation, through stoicism, through working with my mentor to go from somebody who was incredibly unhappy and unfulfilled. I believed that my happiness was predicated on external factors. If I made X amount of dollars, if I got a Ferrari, if I got a $10 million house, and if I got a Playmate wife, I would be happy. And I started to make a lot of money and I started to get the sick place and I started to get the sick cars and I was unfulfilled. And I couldn't understand why, but I was working with a mentor that wasn't just some business guy who had made a shitload of money. He had been so personally developed through stoicism, through Buddhism, through relationships, through, you know, altruism, through helping others, through service, through meditation, through breath, work, through longevity, that I now have become literally the complete opposite of who I used to be. I, I, I've actually never met anyone in my life who was as much of a degenerate glutton as I was, just literally ruining the world in every sense of the word to somebody completely 100% 80 in every single facet of life. And as a result of overcoming those issues, I met someone who said, bro, based on your story, 
I don't know what the fuck you are doing not coaching. Do you really think you've gone through all this pain and all the struggle and overcome it and come out on the other side and have a program that you follow now not to teach and show other people? And this was, you know, six months ago, eight, yeah, six, seven months ago. And I was like, oh, this guy's right. I, I need to start a coaching program. And so I started a coaching program. You know, I have a, a program that helps people develop in many different areas, you know, physique, mindset, health, business, money, relationships, you know, mental talk, the, so many different areas. You know, I have a group program and a one-on-one -on -one program. But the moment I opened this shit up six months ago, I had 12 people sign up within the first week. And six or seven of them have said to me, we've been waiting for you to open a coaching program. Because I had been personally developing employees and people in my life, and I had always loved doing this. And for the first time, dude, after one week, I got on the one-on-one -on -one calls and I got on the group calls, and I felt free. Like I never felt really, really free unless I'm just sitting there helping somebody else. And I said, wow, I'm finally able to make a living out of what I would do for free. And this is my purpose. And I know today that my purpose is to have a positive effect on other people. It has been made very clear to me from God that my purpose is to help other people change their lives in a positive direction and become the optimal version of themselves to affect other people and their future generations in the most optimal way. And so that's what my coaching program does. You know, it's uh, for anyone really looking to change their lives. I have multiple different programs at multiple different price points. I think people like to say that life comes full circle and and the fairy tale ending and, and all that, I think your life really did come full circle. And just thinking back at some of the highlights here for people listening, if you're, if you're still with us here and you've gotten to this point, what's your excuse at this point? I think you're, I think you're, 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 you're making it hard for these people to have an excuse because look at what you've been able to overcome. I think mentorship is so important and you've described how big of an impact it can have on an individual totally and then three i'm so happy for you as an individual that you've gone through all this hardship you've hit that rock bottom and it now has led to you actually having the job well we're not even going to call it a job actually having the career doing what you want to do and that you're happy i think what else is a better testament to doing the right thing and serving people with good intentions on a day-to-day -day basis will give you this beautiful life? Totally. I mean, I, I think, I think my struggle and my, my bottom developing the spiritual relationship with God and relying on him more and more, it's, it's made it very clear to me what I should be doing. And I've been very blessed that he's shown me the path of, Hey, this is your, the purpose for Wade's life. And time and time again, it's just been made clear that I'm supposed to help other people overcome the problems that I have. And so, I, I mean, I feel very, very blessed that I'm in this position to be able to help people. It's what I love doing and it's what I'm best at. You know, I just, I understand other people and the challenges because I've been through it all. I think that's so perfectly said. Where can people find you? Anybody listening right now, where's the best way for them to find you and reach out? Maybe you've inspired somebody listening. Uh, Instagram is uh, is the best platform. It's Wade Houston on Instagram. Uh, I respond to all my own DMs, so just message me there. Perfect. And all of Wade's information will be linked in the bio below. Um, dude, thank you so much for sitting down and having this conversation. <laughs> I know we've had some technical difficulties, and I appreciate you kind of riding this one out with me. But No problem. Thanks for having me. I have these conversations, and, and I can confidently say this is one of my favorite ones that I've had. And you're somebody that I would like to stay close to because I think a lot of what you say, maybe not at this mass scale, but resonates with me inside as I'm trying to find myself as a second time entrepreneur working a day job that I do enjoy, but I have grander kind of <laughs> thoughts. Meeting people like you are, are the reason why I started a show like this. Um, so thank you so much. And I, I tell all my guests like now, I, I, most of the guests that come on, I've consumed your content, whether it was to learn about you or I just had already followed you from a younger me. And I now feel invested in all of my guests' success and yeah. like can go. And when I come across somebody who I think would be perfect for you to meet with, I now have somebody in my Rolodex, Wade, go reach out to this person. That's who's going to change your life. So I'm personally really excited to see you continue to grow 
And thank you for being part of my journey here on this show. Appreciate you, man. Thanks for having me on.